Welcome to the Health on Track podcast. Let's talk well-being. Welcome to the Health on Track podcast, offering you a shot of wellness. I'm Hayley, member engagement and PR manager at GIG Golf. Money, savings, retirement are all topics that make us anxious. How much do I save? How can I make more money? Will my family be okay if I lost my job? So many questions. Today, our guest speaker is not a miracle worker or can promise to make us rich. However, he will guide us through a series of questions and help us feel more confident about our future. Introducing an award-winning financial expert known for his expertise in wealth coaching and financial advisory. With over 25 years of global experience, our guest speaker has distinguished himself as a leading voice in the financial sector, providing bespoke wealth management solutions and insightful financial coaching to our diverse clients health. Mike, Cody, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Hayley. Hello. A very impressive bio, I must say, award-winning. Um, firstly, like retirement planning. What is that? What is retirement? Yeah. yeah. I mean, retirement, obviously, everyone gets the concept of retirement and what it is, but what is the planning for it? I think the word retirement means different things to different people. I think for many people, it's what I would refer to the ultimate destination. It's that period of time or a period of life where you don't get to have a job, <laughs> you don't get to have a boss, you get to spend time where you want, when you want, doing what you want with loved ones and family. Yeah, And you can do that at any age. 40, 45, because you've planned for it. For other people, it becomes something that hits us, hits us hard almost. So we get to the age 60, 65, where we can't work. We don't want to work. Our employers don't want us anymore. Our skills have almost become redundant, particularly with the advent of AI. We'll get to the stage where you know, nobody wants us anymore. And we get to that age where the income will stop and we have to turn upon our assets and our savings to last us for the next 20, 30, 40 years. So retirement can be lots of things. It can be a well-planned out affair, or it can be a default struggle. And hence why the word planning is so important in those early stages of our life and our career. I loved how you put, the first answer to the, to the question was, it made it sound really exciting mm -hmm. and fun. And I was like, I want to retire. Um, but for most people, it is very stressful. It is something that they, are, they do get anxious about. So when should, to, to be able to have, to create what you created as something that was really exciting and really fun, being able to get to, I loved your expression there, you get to enjoy your days, you get to not have a job. When should people start thinking about retirement planning? I think if we break our sort of life into thirds, the bit that we grow and educate, mm -hmm. the bit that we get to use and apply our skills, and the bit where we get to have that retirement phase, yeah? So I think for most people, retirement should be seen as, as a positive. I think a lot of the time people see old people and think they're born that way and that retirement is some sort of negative period of their life. I think with the advent of medicine and technology now, people live a much more sort of fruitful and enjoyable retirement for 10, 20 years after they retire, you know, particularly as expats. You know, if we're used to traveling, we'll travel the world. If we've had children overseas, the chances are our children will live in different parts of the world and those all need money, yeah? So when pensions and retirement planning first came about, it was on the advent that people would work for 30, 40, 50 years and they would retire for five or six or seven years and you needed to save enough during that sort of 30 or 40 years to allocate for the next five or seven. But the reality has become so much more different now. So, you know, lots of people, particularly skilled, don't start their real job till 25. They want to retire at 60, 65. So you've really got a sort of 35, 40 year time span. And once you retire, you've got a similar time span on the other side. So nowadays you need to save during a period of 30 years for a period of another 30 years, yeah? So you need to replace yourself as an employer because ultimately in retirement, you as your employer will be paying yourself during that 30 year period. So retirement planning needs to start as early as possible. Mm -hmm. In the ideal world, when you work in a domestic market like the US, the UK, Europe, Australia, you start a pension as soon as you start work because your company will enable it. Yeah. Yeah, they'll facilitate it. 
in this part of the world, we get a gratuity, but it doesn't operate in the same way. Most people that I work with, yeah. when they change job, they get their gratuity lumped into their sort of final pay. And use it. And it gets caught up in the credit card <laughs> bill, a luxury holiday, Christmas. So they never, yeah, so they never have that, that longevity of money in the same way that locked away money would, yeah? So in this part of the world, one of the reasons that we get paid so much more is because we don't get the provisions that a domestic market employer would give us, like a solid pension, yeah? So we need to take that extra salary that we get and make a provision for our future. In the same way as we also get tax benefit here as well. Mm -hmm. In most parts of the world, we're not paying 30, 40, 50% taxes that we would do. We should also be conscious and try and use some of that savings to allocate for tomorrow. Yeah. But definitely divide the, your life into three boxes. Okay. Education and growth, application, and being able to then use your assets for your own final third. Yeah. What you said about tax is really interesting. I I personally have never even seen it like that. Okay. I've moved over here and just thought, okay, what's well, tax-free? Great. But actually what you're saying is to apply, if you were getting this salary anywhere else in the world, that now we're tax-free, do we look at saving that that we would have we would have been charged for in any other place in the world exactly which is a really great way, way exactly. to look at it because you're not taking anything away from one of, your one of, the, one of the good examples I, was was for me during covid so typically when i work with clients when you do the plan or the, the analysis you might work out that somebody needs to save 30 percent of their income mm -hmm. for their future self for their future needs and actually for many people that's a step too far in the first instance. We need to work towards that figure over a period of years. But often in COVID, we've seen many employers drop salaries by 30 or 50 or 50 percent. And surprisingly, many families cope with that. Mm. The reason that they did is they shared the problem with their family. Yeah, they identified, listen, we're on a 50 percent reduction. These are the cuts we're going to make. We're going to make a re reduction in our expenses. We're going to make a reduction in our second car. We're going to make some decisions but we have to, we have to. Sometimes when it comes to retirement planning, people aren't so eager to make the have to decisions. They often work out what is available based upon their current spending habits and then try and allocate that. Sometimes you have to go back into the budgets and work out, right, where can I save money in my current expenditure pattern and allocate that for my future self? Savings is not a bill. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. Savings is for you tomorrow, mm -hmm. yeah? Bills are for you today. There's a difference. Okay. I think that's really interesting what you said about the um, have to, mm -hmm. because you're right, a lot of people did manage. Or if they didn't manage, they were able to save more because either they weren't doing as much. Yeah. So they, they, you then got a clearer idea of, okay, what does this look like? But some people don't have even an idea of what they're spending. Yeah. What do you say to people that kind of, haven't really ever sat down and looked at what they're spending. So what you what you just said there was really great to kind of look at the bills that are going out. But a lot of people only know their rent or their mortgage cost. So most, most professional expats that I work with or are here in places like the UAE, in their job will run some form of budgeting, forecast, project management system and are accountable for expenditure. At work. They know, <laughs> they know how to do it, yeah. they do it in their job, and they probably do it with much bigger numbers. But many of them fail to take those skill sets back into their home life and will just spend throughout the month and then do the catch up at the end of the month and will you know, allow themselves what's left yeah. on luxury items. There's no, there's no budgeting. Yeah? In the same way as in work, people often work with what I call a business continuity plan. Most people understand what a business continuity plan is. If the building burns down or a senior member of staff leaves, what is the continuity of the business? I often talk to people about what is your family continuity plan if something goes wrong? If you lose your health or lose your job or lose your income, what happens? Yeah, and they can't answer those questions in the same way as they would do their business continuity plan. So one of the things I always encourage clients to do is to create a budget. So I always look at 12 months in advance and I will always forecast. So I look at my income or income streams. I break down my expenditures, rent, mortgage, DIWA, et cetera, et cetera. And I look at the a level of savings or profit that I can make as me business limited mm -hmm. at the end of each month. So let's say that's 5,000 dirhams. Yeah. 
I know if I consistently do that over the forecasted 12 months, at the end of the year, I would have managed to save and allocate 60,000 dirhams. Mm -hmm. By having that forecast, that becomes more important to me than the latest iPhone. Because I have, I have a reason. I have a reason. That's become a fundamental driver in my aspirations for the year. I won't get caught up on silly expenses. At the end of the month, I then go over my forecasts and I make them actual. Mm -hmm. So I look at it and say, ah, I managed to save 6,000. And then I put one more month on at the end. So I'm always 12 months in advance of my forecasting. Okay. And then I just follow through with my actuals. And that's from a personal... From a personal perspective, yeah. Because a lot of people would be like, that's a bit... That's a it's lot. Very, it's very easy to do. Yeah. There's lots of software that even does it now. But even if you just take the basics of an Excel, you take your income or your family income, any other little income streams that you may have, you break down your major components. Then sometimes by looking at it, you can see, ah, hold on a sec, I'm using a personal trainer. If I got rid of my personal trainer, I'd now have 9,000. Mm -hmm. Or I spend quite excessively on nights out Perhaps I should stream that down. Maybe I can increase. So by seeing your levels of expenditure, you will also be harsher on yourself be to say, shocked. yeah, <laughs> actually 60,000 dirham saving is not enough for me. I'd like to get that to 100,000. What do I need to cross out mm. to get there? Yeah. But if you hold yourself accountable and you have a vision for what that number will be, you will live by that. Yeah. If you don't, then the months just tick on. There's no goal. There's always something else. And saving just becomes one of those things you'll do next year. A bit like people's wills or their insurances. <laughs> it's just things that they'll do. Yeah, OK. Because retirement isn't one of those things that we see as urgent. Mm -hmm. Christmas presents are. Or brunches are. Because yeah. we're Friend's here. Friend's birthday. Exactly. Yeah. So listen, I just need to do these things now. Once I clear these next few months, then I'll definitely do things in the future. <laughs> Correct, yeah. It's like a diet, right? Yeah. I'll do it in January. Start in January. I'll do it in January. Okay, okay. but for, for many, January never comes. That there is actually how I live. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even just saying this to you, but um, myself and my partner, we, when we met, I had this spreadsheet and we did actuals. Yeah. And we, so we have a different spreadsheet for the actuals and we have columns for food, for mm. uh, entertainment, for um, nappies for the baby and things like that. So um, we go and... It, at first, he found it really, really uncomfortable because he didn't like seeing the amount we were spending. Yeah. Um, but that has helped us. But I think when I do tell people about this spreadsheet, people think I'm a bit crazy and a bit too rigid on One of the reasons people don't like the spreadsheet is they don't like the answer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the amount of people that have, I've worked with over the years, particularly on the coaching side, where they've come to me and say, listen, you know, I'm running out of money. We've got no money. I've got a good job been in Dubai six or seven years, and we're just not making ends meet. Okay, do me a spreadsheet. The reason they don't want to do it is they're scared of the answer, right? Yeah. They know that if they're earning X, and, they they're, spend, and they're spending X plus 20. Yeah. Yeah. They know they're not going to like the answer. So they put off doing the exercise. Mm -hmm. As soon as you've done the reality of the exercise, you can then work out, right, what do we need to do? What about the personal loan? What about the credit cards? What about some of these luxury items? What about we go for a period of six months where we don't have any luxury items? That will get us back to ground zero, and then we can excel from there into a savings mechanism. Yeah? So it's just about awareness. In the same way, and we talked about the diet, yeah? If you randomly eat, yeah, yeah you never know the outcome. No. If you want to lose weight, <laughs> you yeah, to you have to control yeah. the inputs. Yeah, it's kind of like the opposite yeah. with wealth, yeah? But if you control the numbers, <laughs> then, yeah. yeah, yeah, then you control the outcome. Okay. Know your numbers. And I think what you said about kind of forecasting and saying, actually, how I want a target, I want to get to 100,000 by the end of the year. So what, how does that look and how am I going to get there? With that 100,000, what, sh what should we do? This is yeah. going to be a very broad answer. And I know it, there's a, a well, lot. It doesn't have to be that broad. So for, when, again, we sit down with clients, the most important thing is we work out what it is that they have as objectives in their life. So typically when I'm working with a 50 year old, there in many respects is a panic about what's coming. Yeah. yeah? And that is their next stage of retirement. Clearly when I'm working with a 25 year old that doesn't own their own house, it would be foolish to divert all of their available assets into 
Retirement planning, yeah. So it's again, do we need to get somebody an emergency fund? Do we need to get somebody onto the property ladder? Mm -hmm. Do you want to build a business in the future and might need some assets to get you through those first startup periods, yeah? So it's about finding out what your objectives are. Are there some short ones? Are there some medium ones and some long-term ones? It's a bit like the old-fashioned jam jar approach, yeah? Do you remember? Yeah. <laughs> you have jam jars <laughs> and you say, right, that's for Christmas, that's for the kids, that's for something else. Rainy day. <laughs> yeah. And then we work out in a sort of more sophisticated way what it is we need in those ultimate pots by when, what is our available budgets, what are our priorities, what's more important than others, and then we can allocate the appropriate resources each month into everything. I always suggest, even though when there are shorter term objectives, that we do something for the long term, yeah, because it just gets you off to that psychology. One of the frustrations I always have in this part of the world is you almost get two types of clients. Those types of clients that understand what they need to do, so they'll just do it. It may not be the exact level of savings they can, like they may not know exactly what they're saving for, but they commit from day one and they make it happen. Other expats are, I'm not sure about my job, or I'm not sure about what's happening with this, or this Christmas coming up, or we're taking a trip, or I just want to do this, yeah? There's a million, and yeah, there's a million different things that stop them committing. The problem in this part of the world is a year becomes two, two becomes three, three becomes four. Now you're seven years down the line. Yeah, you know, they arrive here at 30, they're then 38, they're living the same excuse. Yeah. The reality is, even if your job is semi-unstable, things like retirement planning, your children's education, your mortgage payments, they all still need fulfilling, mm -hmm. yeah? So you still have to commit, but just make sure that we build enough flexibility in whatever solutions are are desired to make sure that they accommodate those changes. But you can't put off what is a current problem. People must it's start. Not a problem right now. Yeah. People even say, you know, I can't afford to save. It's like, could you, could you afford to save $5? Yes. So save $5. Okay. Don't not do it. Just pay it a token amount because most people don't do it. Do something and then over the course of time, leverage more money into that account mm. because you've got some commitment. That was my next question, actually, was if someone says, OK, I only have, so I've done my spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. This is how it looks. I now only have a thousand, um, we'll say, dollars to save per month. Is that worth it or should that thousand dollars just be spent on me living my life? I'm sure you get that a lot. Let me just live my life because I don't want to waste my life that I'm living right now. So everybody should do a plan, all right? Ideally with a professional, whether that's you know, a mentor in the space, whether that's a money coach, whether that's a financial advisor, build a plan. When I build a plan with clients, sometimes you look at the variables and say, right, I want to bake this cake called retirement, yeah? But I've only got these ingredients to make it, yeah? I can't make that cake with those ingredients. So sometimes I tell clients, you need to go back to your employer, yeah? Because right now, your job doesn't match your requirements. So in the next couple of three years, we need to think about getting you some significant pay rises or you need to think about uh, getting a new job. Because if you were on X, I need you to be on 2X in the next couple of years. So sometimes it's not just about your disposable. Sometimes I'll go back to basics with clients and say, listen, you need to be more demanding with your career, with what you earn. Then we'll look at the basics and say, you know, certain clients do genuinely spend all their money on predefined things and they're, they're committed to their families. Other people are just not in control of their money. Yeah, so again, going back to the basics, or sometimes working with the client saying, right, you can afford $1,000 today, that's what we'll commit, but the next time you get a pay rise, the next time you get a bonus, if your spouse goes to work, then I want 100% of that commitment. So if you're on 20,000 dirhams, for example, and you get a 3,000 dirham pay rise, that all goes. That all goes. And again, because you've lived off of correct. that. And once you've got a plan, it's so much easier then to, to knit that in the bud. Yeah. The problem is, if you have three or four or five months on the new salary... You're now at the new you're now lifestyle. Living, you're now living the new lifestyle, yeah. correct. And in you know, Dubai and Abu Dhabi, etc., have a lot of lifestyle, lifestyle. creep. <laughs> yeah. So when it comes to how much do I need to save? So we spoke about planning, forecasting, 
now I've got my disposable income that I can now spend on luxury items mm -hmm. or leisure. Um, how much should people be saving? So, I've been doing this job for 20, 25 years, and I've heard all sorts of formulas throughout those periods, yeah? So, often I hear 10%, 20%, 30%. I used to hear this one in the UK many years ago, half your age as a percentage of your wage. Half your age as a percentage of your wage. I quite like that one, but yeah. I'm guessing it's not true. <laughs> so, these are, these, are easy, these are easy numbers. Yeah. One of the reasons I talk about doing a plan is in many respects it should be slightly more, more scientific than that. So rather than start at how much you can save, let's go to the objective. Mm -hmm. Where are you trying to get to? So these are the fundamental factors that I'd look at. Where does somebody want to retire? Or where do we think they'll retire? What is the currency in that location? Is it different to what you might save in? Mm -hmm. Are there potential fluctuations between those two currencies? Yeah, the dollar versus rand is a good example. Yeah. Um, what is the requirement in that country? So a, a retirement in Asia is different to a retirement in Northern Europe, mm -hmm. for example. What is the inflation perspective? What is the economic outlook and the growth potential? What is your acceptance of risk and volatility? That will dictate your return requirements. Yeah? What is the taxation requirements in those particular countries? What age do you want to retire? Do you want just income? Do you want escalating income? Do you want some money in an account as well as an income that you can buy a new car, develop the house, you know, look after the children? So once we've kind of built that as a, as a visual, then we apply all those numbers and almost reverse engineer a number. Yeah, and it's, in many respects, it's not a percentage. We would say to you, listen, you, know, you need to save X dollars per month and we kind of take into account also, well, listen, this is where you are with your career. This is your expected vision. So you'll be on future pay rises. You'll be on future promotions. We can get more income in the future years. But right now you need to spend or save X per month to your future retirement account. For many of the people, they can't get near that number. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually how big the number often is when you actually do the calculation properly. Do you share that with yeah, people? Because yeah. that yeah, would Yeah, we, we visualize it. And I'm sure that yeah. would scare a lot of people knowing yeah. that I have to save that much to be able to comfortably yeah. retire. And then it's about working with them and say, listen, if you need to save a thousand, but you can only afford 500, we'll start with 500, but we'll commit you over the course of time to a higher number when you get things like your pay rises or your promotions. Yeah. yeah. When you do the plan, however, it's about making sure that what is feasible and what is realistic. So again, if we're looking at the numbers and the numbers can't be achieved, then it might be about saying, can we have less or more income? Can we change your retirement date so it's slightly later? Can we invest your money slightly more uh, adventurous, maybe more exposure in the equity markets so we can get a higher expected perceptive level of return? Yeah. Can we change perhaps the country that you might retire? Yeah. Can it costs a living. Correct. Can we downsize your property? So once we've essentially balanced between what is feasible versus what is available, mm -hmm. then that becomes a plan that everybody can adhere to. There's no point you saving 10, 20, 30 percent because you think it's the right number yeah. and then you getting to the end of what you think is the rainbow and then it's like, yeah, <laughs> I, didn't, yeah. I didn't think it would look like this. Yeah. yeah? But it this is one is of my those. Life now. Yeah, yeah, but it is one of those things that just needs constant evaluation. Yeah. Like, like many things. Yeah. And for people that are, well, you, you mentioned about where to invest and do adventurous mm -hmm. investments. And I know a lot of people um, get nervous about those things because if they don't understand it and they're going to invest like their hard own, earned money, if they only have a, a small amount of savings that they can invest every month, they will be scared to put that into something that they're not sure on. How do you coach people through that? Like, yeah. I'm sure you have that fairly often. So again, as part of that plan, once you understand what risk or volatility somebody can accept in their portfolio or their assets, then you can explore the underlying uh, asset classes that you might look at. The reality is when people are saving for retirement, it's exceptionally long term in most cases. So you want to buy assets that will appreciate quickly without significant volatility. Yeah. So real estate for many people works very well for that. 
yeah, you know, we refer to often as a store of value. The, re the reality is I don't care what the valuations are in the short term. What I really care about is, is it going to be on target for 60? So equity markets are often the preferred vehicle for retirement planning because statistically they give the higher level of return. People might use some level of bonds to smooth out the volatility. But again, the better return you want, the lower level of bonds you would accept. Some nationalities like commodities, particularly here in the UAE, because they see it, particularly gold, as a great store of value, which is the opposite to some of my younger clients that almost have become investors through gamification. So for example, they'll or get into the crypto space. Mm -hmm. They'll be looking at their valuations on an hour by hour basis. Yeah. And if they've minute got, by minute, I've yeah. seen it. <laughs> and if they've got, let's say $10,000 in a crypto yeah. account and it makes $500 or $1,000 in a day, they become overly excited mm -hmm. because it's in some respects, it feels like a game. Yeah. Yeah. The reality is plus or minus $1,000 doesn't give you a retirement. No. Yeah. When you have a mortgage and you go to the bank and you buy a house, you say to the bank, lend me some money over 20 or 30 years. I'm going to pay you a payment. And at the end of the 20, 30 years, you'll give me the keys or the contract that I own the house. That's the deal. And you pay that payment every single month. Yeah. And the commitment is the house becomes yours at, at the, the end, end of it. Retirement's no different. Yeah. I will agree through a plan that you save X amount per month at the end of the 30 years, I'll give you the keys to not have a job. To your retirement. Yeah, I'll, give <laughs> yeah. you the, I'll give you the keys to, to let your boss know what you think of him, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. But that's, but that's the schedule. Okay. You know, plus or minus $1,000 on a gamification yeah. is not the answer to retirement planning. Okay. Yeah. You want long-term, good producing assets that have a good storage of value that are reliable on you making money for your future. Yeah. Okay. Certain asset classes are okay to have some fun with, yeah. Yeah. And enjoy. And if you make some money, great. And if you don't, it's not the end of the world. But there are certain assets for retirement planning. There are certain assets for essentially uh, gambling. I mean, crypto has become a huge, mm -hmm. huge space. Like, there's companies that do crypto yeah. now. There's there's uh, people that train people how to do crypto. Yeah. Um, are you saying that you feel that the kind of real estate is the more sustainable um, or how no, I think, to make more money? I think it's no, I think it's about having diversification. Okay. You know, in, in many respects, if you're, if you're in the US and you have a 401k or if you're in Australia and you have a superannuation or if you're in the UK and you have a personal pension, yeah. for most people, that is a portfolio of stocks and shares yeah. and some bonds and you'll get some volatility, you'll get some growth returns, six, seven, eight percent per annum and you'll contribute monthly and you'll do that over a 23, 20 to 30 year period and you'll build up a portfolio, you'll get to 65, and you will live off that portfolio. That, for most people, is what a strategy looks like in retirement. But you can also diversify that. You know, having a second property or a third property and having some rental income, whereby once you've paid off the mortgage, you receive a rental income, you re get some capital upside, we hope, yeah. on the value of the property. Um, we just need to be careful of, you know, what are the tax requirements? What are the servicing requirements? How much hassle do you want in your retirement? Yeah. But there's nothing wrong with diversification. Yeah. But I often think there are different descriptions of what I would call wealth assets and what I would define as retirement assets. So retirement assets, you just want good long term store of values. Wealth assets may be more trading short term, you know, almost like flipping a property. Yeah rather than renting out a long term. So you've got okay. wealth assets, retirement assets. For some people, there is a difference in what those two deliver. Okay, thank you. I think that's, hopefully people listening here will be able to kind of differentiate the difference. And if not, I think that's what you guys are here for. Um, how is it that when someone is thinking about it, and I think most of us, when we get to kind of the middle of your three categories mark, uh, if they haven't done so already, they start to panic. They yeah. start to think, okay, I've actually only got another, I'm now 30. If we're saying I want to retire at 60, I'm halfway through and I haven't even thought about it. Yeah. Is this something that you believe, um, I think, that should be taught at school, that should yeah. be taught from a young age, um, not just obviously retirement planning, but 
in all areas, financial planning um, and how that looks and why, what is the importance of it? Yeah, so I think before I go on to that, I think often what I look at when I, when I, when I work with clients initially in the simplestest form is sometimes all these things sound a little bit too complex. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit overbearing. An alien. Yeah, people. you know, you're scared of making a decision yeah. because you're scared of making the wrong decision okay. with the wrong person. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes those factors stop you or you position it as I'll do it tomorrow and then tomorrow never really comes. Yeah. When I need to. Yeah. <laughs> so I always say in simple terms, you know, get a white piece of paper and draw three boxes. Yeah. Box number one is somewhere to live. Okay. Yeah. A roof over your head, ideally with the mortgage paid off. Yeah. Box number two is your wealth account. Some money that you can have in a portfolio that is yours, that you can spend whenever you want to, on whatever you want, and you have freedom, okay. yeah? Box number three is your income. That's what's gonna give you an income in retirement. Mm -hmm. So in that box, I need a property, a portfolio, some stocks and shares, something else, yeah? All of those things I can't spend. If I spend them, I'll stop getting my income. Okay. So those are the three things that I need at my retirement age. I need box number one, mm -hmm. somewhere to live, I need box number two, yeah, a portfolio of money, and box number three is my income. And people just need to write, what's the value of my house? What's the value of the wealth account that I want? And what's the value of the retirement income? That's the first stage. And then they should work with a professional to then start calculating and re-engineering. In terms of education at school, again, so much of it, I think, is also assisted by parents. Yeah, helping you know your children understand. You know, when I look at what my children do at school, compared to what they could or should or might be doing, often it's uh, not relevant to the real world. So I think there's a lot more, a lot more that could be done in the school system. But I think while we live in that world where that probably is not going to happen for the next five, 10, 15 years, there are lots of online courses now. Lots of parents are working in this space, just understanding the simplicities of, you know, what does money look like. What does debt look like? Yeah. What are the irresponsibilities of spending? Yeah. How do you budget? How do you save? And many of those behaviours can be taught with children, you know, by simple uh, behavioural skills, you know, during the course of their upbringing. Yeah. I think it's something that from a young age really should be brought into mm -hmm. uh, their education. Mm -hmm. Or even if it's just very simple of how does this look? OK, I want, I want this suite or I want this toy. OK, great. So how much money do you have? Yeah. Well, actually, I don't have any because you have the money. And how do I have that money? And kind of educating them in that way. And then even just doing games like a point system to help them learn and understand how much something costs to then purchase and buy it. Because otherwise, some people grow up and have credit cards that is plastic that isn't actually your money. Yeah. And then we get into debt. Yeah. And then you're in a downward cycle that you can't get out of. It's very intimidating. I see, and I, see and this a, I see this a lot in Dubai. It's almost kind of like the Dubai cycle. You know, people arrive here, Western expats, for example, and they believe their salary will go much further mm -hmm. than they think it will. So they compare it back to their UK salary or their European salary. Double and triple. Yeah, there's yep. no tax. It sounds great. I'm, I'm on big money. My uh -huh. job title sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> they come to Dubai or places like that and they spend as if they're on holiday. Yeah. And of course, you're moving into an apartment. It's empty. So you need to get a sofa and curtains and cutlery and all sorts yep. of domestic stuff. <laughs> so all of these things cost money. Yeah. You're entertaining. You're living a new lifestyle. And you burn through that cash. Making much. friends, going out. Yeah. yeah. You burn through that cash yeah. much quicker. On about month two or month three, you get that call from the bank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all get that call yeah. from the bank. Yeah, what do you like? <laughs> the bank come to the rescue and say, can we bail you out? Yeah. How about you take one of our shiny cards? Yeah. We'll give you some certainty as to what your next few months looks like. And you get all these benefits. And you get benefits. So the more course, you spend, the more benefits. So what happens? People run up the credit card yeah. very quickly. Then they get to the end of the credit card and they get another call by the bank and they say, ah, would you like to consolidate into a personal loan? Yeah. And then they stretch that and a loan. Some people at that point burn the credit card mm. or some people keep it open with a zero balance yeah. and go again. So it's not unusual here that I find people take a couple of years just to resolve that traditional debt issue yeah. that so many people get into when they first come here. Yeah. You know, the pressure that the banks often put on 
consumers to take credit mm -hmm. and the way that which they embrace the ease of credit often means that people will fall into the trap of that. And that, of course, then delays other things that you should be doing, such as building up your wealth or retirement <laughs> planning or other factors. Yeah. yeah. So again, you know, is that kids or is that equal, well, equally, <laughs> equally, yeah. equally 30 year olds yeah. that are getting into the same trap? Yeah, yeah. for sure. But, you know, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, these places, it's easy to consume. Mm -hmm. And when someone does get into that trap, yeah. Uh, what do you advise and what do you recommend? Apart from, obviously, we've, we've talking, spoken about a few strategies that they can do, with, like their spreadsheets and yeah. things like that. What else can they do? So the most important thing when, people, when somebody has debt is, is, is often to share that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of mental stress, and maybe that's a different subject, but there's a, a lot of mental stress that goes with credit cards mm -hmm. and debt. You know, to the extent that even I find people in married relationships Hiding. don't even share it with their with their true loved ones, yeah? yeah? And that causes huge amounts of anxiety on mm -hmm. persons. So I think the most important thing is you need to share the problem, mm -hmm. whether that be with a professional, whether that's in some sort of coach, or with their loved ones, a friend, a family member, a colleague, and just say, listen, I've got myself into a problem, I'm a bit embarrassed, but listen, if I share it, I feel that by sharing it and brainstorming it, there may be a better outcome. Yeah. So if I'm sitting with the client, first thing I need to do is know the numbers, yeah? because Everybody thinks it's going to get better. When they get paid, it'll be okay. Pay it off. Yeah. And when you work out the numbers, it's like, listen, again, it's going to get worse because your expenditure is higher than your income. Yeah. So what can we get rid of out of the expenditure? How lean can we get that? If it can't be, much, if it can't be made much leaner, then we need to look at or think about converting the debt. So if I'm on credit card debt where I'm paying 30, 40, 50% in interest, which means I'm never really reducing the capital, I'm just servicing the bank profits. I need to convert that into maybe something that's longer, but a much lower interest rate, somewhere yeah. in the region of six, seven, eight, where I have a controlled payment. It might be 2,000 dirhams, but it might be over two years. But you know how much is going to come I don't really want to stretch the debt over two years, but that's an, afford that's an affordable amount. I may, pay, I may pay a higher level of interest ultimately, but I can afford to move. I've got some breathing space. That will, that will reduce my mental stress. I will feel like I've got a handle of the situation. I need to take the credit card out of arm's reach to make sure that I don't use it and can't use it. And then I go back over a period. And just, you work with somebody and say, listen, it's going to be a tough nine months, mm -hmm. but if you do this strategy for nine months, the break-even point is that point. Yeah? yeah. Most people I find that have got themselves into that circumstance just want a hope or a belief or some comfort in knowledge mm. that at some defined point in the future, they're, they're okay. It. Yeah. Yeah. Because if they don't have that, it gets worse and worse and worse. And so many people get into this negativity of mental health space and, you know, there are consequences to that for so many people. Yeah, for sure. I think it's yeah. money it probably causes one of the mm -hmm. biggest anxieties for most people. 100% so. for, for more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. Because most people Impacts. don't share. Yeah. You know, I've worked with clients over the years that have been you know, part of scams or frauds mm. that, again, are so embarrassed. They fell for it. Yeah, that they fell for it, that they still will not share it with their wife. Yeah. Or husband. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these scammers are getting good at what they do. Very good. Um, what would you say to someone that wants to reach out to someone like you, who is an expert, yep. but thinks, I don't know, firstly, is embarrassed, mm. but or secondly, they don't know if they can afford, obviously they're, they're already concerned about their finances, so can they afford to go and see a coach? Can they afford to see a financial advisor? How does that look? What would you say to them? Yeah, so there are lots of good quality money coaches and financial advisors in the UAE market. Yeah, there's lots of good, very well regulated, uh, very strong, very thorough financial advisors that work in this space, yeah? So the most important thing is m almost all of those people within the market, many of my colleagues, both in terms of my firm or different firms, will offer, you know, one or two meetings initially without any cost or charge. Yeah, a get to know you. That gives an opportunity for you to feel comfortable with that person. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Yeah. Get a better understanding of what benefits they can bring you, what things they can solve. And then ultimately, if you entrust them to help you going forward, then you can discuss, you know, the value side of the proposition of, you know, is an investment in time or in investment or retirement plan or some sort of mechanism to move you forward worth it for me, yeah? But most people in our industry will offer those initial consultations as a get to know you 
um, before they start talking about fees, charges and anything else. That's, that's great to know. And I think I, I hope anyone listening who needs help uh, or needs someone like your expert with your expertise to kind of help and guide them through will kind of call and will speak to a financial advisor to get them through that. That is all we've got time for. I could speak for hours. Um, my brain is ticking already and I, I'm sure all of our listeners are as well. So thank you so much for being with us thank and you sharing your me. knowledge. In our upcoming episode, we'll talk about achieving your goals and how to become a happier version of yourself. So stay tuned and don't forget we're available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Angami. Stay well and keep thriving. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.